the government of the day has given up on ESCOM. And it is no coincidence that the ANC Lekhotla resolution has come out in writing and said that we cannot put our eggs in one basket called ESCOM. Two, that we have, we have as a country, we must introduce competition in the generation sector. Three, we must give the consumers the option to buy power from suppliers they choose to buy. Three, five, we must encourage private sector participation in the generation space. For all that to happen, we need to have equitable and uh, unbiased access to the transmission grid. To have an unbiased and equitable access to the transmission grid, you need to unbundle ESCO. So this was tried before. You will remember the systems and market operator in 2001. Um, that was eventually stopped, I remember very well, by Deputy Minister Kotongwane. And the reason it was stopped by that time is because the situation was not opportune because um, we just, we, we ran out of base load capacity and to, be, to restructure and introduce the systems of market operator or, or in a system that is constrained is suicidal. And the deputy minister Kotongwane understood it then and stopped it. But we knew at ESCOM that it was bound to come. So the restructuring that's been talked about is purely driven by the pursuit of setting up a systems, of market, systems and market operator that will make the transmission grid accessible uh, in equal terms to all the private players that must come in. I am not surprised that the date of March 2020 was put in place because that has to happen so that when the ministerial determination is approved and signed off by NERSA, that the, the transmission company is a subsidy, is, an, is, is, is unbundled and it's a, it's a subsidiary of ESCOM. It will not necessarily be privatized. Um, but it will remain a holding company. The important part of that is that government wants to take away uh, the painful experience that they went through in, the 20, in 2016 when they asked me to sign the IPPs for between the 3.5, and I refused. I refused because I was wearing an ESCOM hat. And I knew that as a CEO of ESCOM, I cannot sign a transaction that will reduce ESCOM sales. My fiduciary duties did not allow me and I would not be acting in the interest of ESCOM. Government has learned that the hard way and that is why they want to speedily move and unbundle ESCOM and separate transmission so that there is no one, per, one person in the same way as Mr. Coco did, who will slow down the renewable energy IPPs. What is the implication on ESCOM as we know it today? I have bad news. And let me try to be very slow about this. The draft, the, the, the IRP of 2019 says, fifth, uh, 12,000 megawatt of ESCOM coal will be decommissioned by 20, uh, from, by 20, in this decade, between now and 2030. That's IRP. 12,000 megawatt of ESCOM coal stations will be 
decommissioned by the end of this decade. At the same time, the draft ministerial determination that is currently with NERSA, that is out for comment, says that 13,000 megawatt will be procured from the private players and ESCOM will not be allowed to participate. Now, in there lies uh, um, the important point. The 12,500 megawatt of ESCOM will be decommissioned and 13,000 megawatt of private sector renewable plus storage will be built and ESCOM will not be part of it. This is consistent with the energy white paper of 1998 that said that ESCOM will not be part of the build program going forward. And as a matter of fact, 30% of ESCOM generation will be privatized. Government did indeed say through uh, Minister Kwede uh, Mantashi that ESCOM a, a new state-owned company will be procured and it will probably be part of, it will build new capacity. So what, ESC, what government is effectively saying is that uh, 13,000 megawatt of new capacity will be built by the private sector. Government will set up a new company that may participate in that in the new generation capacity post 2030. What does that leave ESCOM of today? It means that in, in 2030, ESCOM will be 12,500 12, megawatts less. I call it ESCOM light. So we will have ESCOM light in 2030, that is 12,500 megawatts. The most important part that uh, colleagues and comrades and friends must understand is that um, customers will be allowed to choose who will supply them with power. ESCOM companies, ESCOM customers will be allowed to sell, to generate for own consumption. The ESCOM sales in terawatt hours will continue to decline. In terms of the NERSA tariff model, ESCOM cost, fixed cost will stay the same, but the ESCOM sales in terawatt hours will continue to decline, which means that ESCOM is entitled to go to NERSA on a, a regulated clearing account to, to require more cost, more tariff, so, so for the customer, it's bad news because the ESCOM light that will be there, that will have the fixed cost with a reducing tariff, will increase its cost and it will be entitled to do that because that's how the tariff model works. So the cost will go away. The costs of ESCOM electricity will, go, will, will continue to rise. When the cost of ESCOM rises to cover for the reduced tariffs, it, cre it, it, it creates a business case for competitive technologies, which means that it becomes cheaper for ESCOM customers to self-generate for themselves and for ESCOM competitors to, bring, to, to, to build for, for customers to go, to go and look for different suppliers. That means the ESCOM death spiral accelerates. Now, which means that uh, for as long as um, ESCOM does not increase its tariff, um, it, does, it does not make sense to say ESCOM is too big to fail because ESCOM has failed. Together with that, 
I also make a submission that because of the 1% decline in ESCOM sales, no amount of government bailout is going to save ESCOM. ESCOM has reported 20 billion loss last year. It will, this year, 2020, in my view, report between 20, 22 and 23 billion rest loss this year, and will continue to report over 20 billion rent losses next year. And these losses, uh, only a fraction of it will be covered by the consumer through the tariff, but no amount of it through government bailout will be covered by government. So this picture simply says, we are witnessing a tectonic change that ESCOM as we know it today um, will become ESCOM light in 2030 and it will, it will cease to exist in the next decade between 2030 and 2014. I do not believe that the private company that government talks about that will be public owned will take off the ground. And therefore my submission is that what we're seeing happening here is the privatization of electricity provisioned through the independent power producers. I do not believe that there is enough courage to deal with the cost drivers that are driving ESCOM down. I do not believe that there's sufficient courage to deal with the cost of code in the manner that Brian Molifa dealt with, with them in 2016, 2017, 2018. I do know that because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, ESCOM has declared a force majeure on coal suppliers. But I make a submission to you that uh, the force majeure that ESCOM has declared, purely based on the contracting terms that I'm aware of, ESCOM will come second best. I also know that ESCOM has declared force majeure on renewable IPPs for wind, for, for wind turbines. I, I, I make a submission that there is no political will to support ESCOM in that regard. Why do I see that is because if you look at bid window one, two, and three, Minister Mantashe has approved that we, re uh, we renegotiate, uh, renegotiate the bid window one, two, and three tariffs, but it's optional, it says. Now the bid window one, two, and three are very painful to ESCOM because ESCOM buys power from the bid window one, two, and three for four rents, for what it can produce for around 60 cents, and it sells it for around 116 cents. It's a death knell for ESCOM. So ESCOM, in summary, the, the government of the day continues to be committed to the 1998 white paper. The white paper of 1998 sought to set up a systems and market operator it sought to privatize 30% of ESCOM. It sought to reserve the bill program into the future for private sector. I think that is what government is committed to. The ESCOM sales will continue to decline. And for as long as the ESCOM sales continue to decline, ESCOM will not be able to generate sufficient cash flow from its operations to pay for its cost and to pay for its debt of Medubi and Kosile and, and, the, and, and the interest. But there's another dimension to it. There's another dimension to it. The more you decommission ESCOM 12,000 megawatts 
of coal station. And the more you have uh, your fees cost, because government has said to ESCOM the country trench, so the ESCOM fixed cost remains the same. It means in terms of the tariff that the ESCOM cost will go up. What, that, what also that means is that the ESCOM customers in the Southern African power pool will continuously see an affordable tariff from ESCOM. In other words, the ESCOM tariff to Zimbabwe, Botswana, Swaziland will be inflationary to, to, to these countries. It, 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 it means that there will be no incentive for Botswana, there will be no incentive for uh, uh, Swaziland, there will be no incentive for Namibia to continue to buy power from ESCOM. In fact, the ESCOM costs will encourage countries in the Southern African power pool to be self-sufficient. We see that because in my new work as a managing director of Machila Energy, I interact with utilities cross-border and they are determined to be independent of ESCOM because they no longer trust ESCOM with their security of supply, but they are also concerned about the continuing rising cost that comes from ESCOM. So, so the, the picture does not look good. There's an option to this. There's an option to this, and this is the option that we sought to, to, to present but we believe that um, for, 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 for reasons that had nothing to do with the technical, with, the, with, the, with, the, with excellence, but political, and we, were not, we were not listened to. If we take the view that says ESCOM is too big to fail, then we will take decisions that make sure that ESCOM does not fail, but we continue to employ renewable energy independent power producers at the cost and pace that all of us can afford. It means that we, we will then also have to address the between the one, two, and three and be uncompromising to it in the same way that me and Mr. Molife were uncompromising when we refused to extend the renewable the, the independent IPPs that were short term that cost ESCOM 8 billion rands at 8, at 8 megawatt. Everybody has to take the, the pay. What is happening today is that nobody wants to take the pain and everybody is transferring the risks to ESCOM and that is making ESCOM to collapse and government is uh, uh, running out of ideas about how to turn around ESCOM. Let me put it to you this way. ESCOM has no capacity problem. The primary energy cost of ESCOM is killing ESCOM. The first solution for ESCOM is to deal with the primary energy cost for ESCOM. What are the primary energy costs for ESCOM? The primary energy cost for ESCOM is coal first. It cannot be that ESCOM increases for coal is 15% year on year. It cannot be. It cannot be that ESCOM pays Zenco uh, over 1,000 rands per ton of coal. It cannot be. The targeted cost for ESCOM that ESCOM must pay for coal is four rands per ton. If ESCOM is listening, this minister, if minister, uh, uh, Mantashe is listening, this Praveen Gordon is listening, this ESCOM is listening, you need to go out there and make sure that you do not pay more than 400 rands per ton of coal. That's first part. Second part, we need to go out there and renegotiate between the one, two, three, and 3.5 and save 10 billion rands a year out of that. We need to forget that we can increase ESCOM revenue by increasing the ESCOM tariff. When you do that, 
you are encouraging your customers to deflect to defect from the grid you are encouraging uh, your competition to displace you so you cannot do that escom needs to forget about looking at the tariff to increase its revenue escom has to focus on increasing its sales volume the terawatt hours there is no way that as uh, um, south africa can do without a modularized uh, high temperature reactor let me remind you the comrades and friends that the renewable energy when you committed them in 2010 were not the least cost option i was there i was part of the team we took a policy decision to say we know renewables are expensive at that time but we need to decarbonize and we have to take a lead and do it so we made a policy decision to do it that policy decision in hindsight seems to have been a, a, a good one because out of that the renewable the price for renewables have come cheap we need to do the same with the modular reactor or high temperature reactor and i'm very surprised that cal csir is 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 more of a lobby group for renewables and does not encourage research and development in the high temperature modular reactor uh, that comes in at around 200 megawatt that can if success that can be operational around 2030 that can replace a uh, creel power station replace a uh, command power station replace arnot power station i hear i saw a press release from escom that they are exploring options to replace command with renewables it can be it's not an option you know there are options that in that engineers know um i are uh, uh, options that are meant to keep people busy forget about uh, replacing a a, a commodity with solar renewables have a capacity factor of 31% if you replace 2000 megawatt with renewables you need 6000 megawatt it's a no brainer commodity should be replaced with uh, clean uh, fluidized uh, gas fluidized reactor a uh, fluidized combustor and or modular reactor and we should be totally focused on getting a high temperature modular reactor in operations at least in the big, in the first in the first half of the next decade and let that be done by escom and forget the idea of forming another company powerpoint by a power plant company to replace escom it's not going to work if you can't run escom how can you run another company forget it is not going to it's, it's, it's not going to work let me let me summarize and give you what drives the new structure for the electricity industry into the future it is driven by the belief that we should not put our x in one basket called escom that we should introduce competition in the generation sector introducing generation competition in the generation sector is assumed that will uh, reduce the cost of electricity i do not agree with that because uh, competition in the utility space has not led to reduce prices but um, that's neither here nor there Uh, customers will have the right to choose uh, their own electricity supplier we will decarbonize there is no doubt about that there's a strong belief that we need a non discriminatory access to the transmission grid uh, and that requires a systems and market operator and comrades and friends you must not be fooled you will see that it's going to be pushed hard 
it will be pushed hard because that's the most important part. But also there's a belief that ESCOM as it stands is just too big. Uh, so not only are we going to see the unbundling of ESCOM and the hiving out of the transmission company into a, 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 a holding company of ESCOM, but if now that what will also go with transmission is the ESCOM picking plants. They will come out of ESCOM. So ESCOM, as you know it, will, 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 not, have, will not only have 12,500 megawatt, 12, megawatts decommissioned, but its picking plant will, will come out of the ESCOM generation as you know it today, and the picking plant will become part of transmission. Uh, but the same ESCOM generation will be unbundled too. So right now we have one ESCOM um, generation company, but it will be unbundled. It will be unbundled into, in my view, uh, three to four clusters. That will become a, a holding company on their own. And the reason for that is that is the belief that that will encourage competition. I, I move that there is no choice. There is no choice that ESCOM has to renegotiate uh, the bid window one, two, and three. There is no choice that ESCOM has to bargain hard for uh, with the coal suppliers and reduce the coal, uh, the price of coal to around 400 rands per ton. There is no choice um, to allow ESCOM to be, to, be, to be part of the bill program in the future. That is the only way ESCOM sales can improve. If you don't improve ESCOM sales, ESCOM will die. If you form another state-owned company and you give it the mandate of new bill capacity, it means that ESCOM sales will die and ESCOM will cease to exist, and the price and the electricity tariff will increase. I think that these are simple concepts that is difficult for people, that is not difficult for people to interact with unless they are driven by political motives. Let me also say that Renewable energies have become cost effective. The stru cost structure for the renewable energy has become um, cheap. So the debate is not whether we should build renewables. No, that debate is misplaced. We have to build renewables. They are cheap. Renewables have to be built they have to be backed up with storage. And I'm pleased that ESCOM is uh, pursuing 300 megawatts of storage. It has to happen. But let me tell you this. The, the engineer in me simply says, unless you back it up with modularized reactor, security of electricity supply in the future will remain a challenge for you. So all technologies must be on the table. We need to depoliticize that. And ESCOM must forget into looking at the tariff to increase its sales revenue and look at increasing its, its sales volume. Now, the, que the question that are coming online, uh, the question that's being asked is, uh, why have we not had load shedding since the lockdown? There is no conspiracy to that. Um, the lockdown has reduced capacity by up to 9,500. 
ESCOM has installed capacity of 42,000. You have more than enough capacity to meet demand now. If ESCOM load sheds today, it will be irresponsible and it will be reckless and uh, um, it will be very unfortunate. What I think is very painful for me, and I know this for a fact, is why is ESCOM using diesel during the lockdown? Why is ESCOM using diesel when the peak capacity is 24,000 24, megawatt? It should not. ESCOM should go through the lockdown without using diesel to keep the lights on. And the fact that ESCOM is using diesel to, look, to keep the lights on uh, should be worrying all of us. I have, a, I have a recommendation for ESCOM, and one of the questions um, are, 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 is, have been put. You know, when we left ESCOM, ESCOM performance, I said, was excellent since 2001. When Pakaman Hatebe and Jabuma Buza came into ESCOM, he suspended the plant managers, and he accused, and they accused ESCOM technical people of being captured and be corrupt. And the ESCOM people who have been accused of corrupt could not come to the party. And it's difficult to come to the party when you have been called to when you have been when you are called corrupt. It took very long for Pakamani Hatebe to realize that he has alienated the ESCOM employees who should be supposed who are supposed to keep the lights on. Right at the end, when he tried to correct it, it was just too late. Now we have a new leadership at ESCOM. Uh, Pakamani Hatebe saw ESCOM employees as corrupt. The new leaders of ESCOM of today see ESCOM employees as incompetent. That's why you have white, old, white, retired people coming back to ESCOM. That's why you have Sasol people coming into ESCOM. Comrades and friends, I know what I'm talking. ESCOM employees that are supposed to keep the lights on are being alienated from the leadership of ESCOM of today because the leadership of ESCOM of today continues, continue to implant and remind them they are not competent. That's why you need white retired employees. Most of them are not engineers and guys from SASO. These are the same ESCOM people that gave us the best performance in, 90, in 2018. They cannot overnight be incompetent. And for once, I'm not saying that uh, some, there, there is no reason, there is, there is absolutely no corruption. But let me say, where there's corruption, arrest and send people to jail. If you think Machela Koko is corrupt, arrest him and send him to jail. You cannot continue to say people are corrupt and nobody goes to jail. It alienates the ESCOM employees that are law abiding. It alienates the people that are supposed to help you. ESCOM needs all the its engineers. Those engineers worked under me. I trained most of them. They gave ESCOM the best performance of 85% EAF. They made Kubech to be the best in 2017, according to WANU. So they cannot be overnight. I have a plea to Department of Public, to DPE. I have a plea to ESCOM leadership that you have cream of the crop. You have competent engineers. You have people that you can go to war with. They've been to war with me. They've been to war with Prime Relief. They've stopped load shedding in 2015. 
They stopped load shedding in 2016, they stopped load shedding in 2017. For three years, from 8 August 2015 to December 2018, they stopped load shedding. They stopped burning diesel to keep the lights on. They gave me, as their leader at the time, performance that today US ESCOM are now using as a benchmark. Lead your people, lead them properly. They can perform, let them perform. When they perform, the target must be to get the EAF to 80%. When the EAF is 80%, the system becomes deconstrained. When the system becomes deconstrained, you can, give, you can then send power to the mines. You can send power to the manufacturing. You can then do maintenance. The ESCOM liquidity problem is first a technical problem. Once you deconstrain the operational performance, you then spend less on your primary, primary energy cost because you can then dispatch on merit order. When you dispatch on merit order, then you've got sub, you, then you, your primary energy cost, you're saving there. And then you, 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 you go back to where we were in 2016. Remember that in 2016, purely because of our performance, we save we, we, we saved nine billion rands on renewable IPPs. That's why we were bullish enough not to sign the IPPs for two years. Please look after your people. ESCOM cannot die. And to DPE and DOE, please forget to want to build a new ESCOM outside ESCOM. Fix ESCOM. ESCOM can be fixed. ESCOM assets are reliable. I am very happy that ESCOM leadership has come back and said and reversed the decision to decommission ESCOM power plant uh, uh, after 50 years. It's, it's got to. The, the, the psychological compact should be that we will run the ESCOM asset for 60 years up until 2030. After 2030, we'll commission a, a, a high temperature modular reactor and we'll build more renewables and uh, we will not take away revenue from ESCOM. Currently, we are taking away revenue from ESCOM and we expect ESCOM to survive. Now, let me tell you this. For as long as you are taking revenue from ESCOM, no ESCOM will continue to operate at a loss and no amount of bailout will save ESCOM. You are heading one way. Now, I should not be saying this because I, I am in the independent power producer space. And when ESCOM does not perform, I should be happy because I'll be one of the benefactors. I will go to Swaziland and build a, new, a, a, a power plant. I'll go to Swaziland to, to Zimbabwe and build a power plant. I'll go to Zimbabwe to build a power plant. But no, I'm a South African. I need ESCOM to survive. There's enough to do in the region, even when ESCOM is working. So ESCOM must work. We will continue outside ESCOM to deal with the energy poverty. But ESCOM must work. I, I, um, I've, I'm, I'm going to conclude. I'm going to conclude by saying I have no intentions of going back to ESCOM. The energy poverty in the region is chronic and needs people like us to end the energy poverty. ESCOM needs to be enabled, ESCOM needs to be strengthened so that we are able, so that the electricity price, it's all about the electricity price. The electricity price is such that it can stimulate economic development, that it can stop deconstraining the mines and stop deconstraining manufacturing sector. 
we need to go back to the time when Eskom was the king of the castle purely because of his performance. That can be achieved by empowering ESCOM employees. ESCOM employees are competent. They must be led properly. Stop telling them they are corrupt because they are not corrupt. And those that are corrupt, send them to jail. Stop telling them they're incompetent because they're not incompetent. And those that are not competent, they must leave ESCOM. But if you continue with the current trajectory, we will have ESCOM light in 2030. And beyond 2030, ESCOM as you know it today, will see to disappear. And the, the, the provision of electricity will be privatized through, through the IPPs. So just mind my weight, I'm not talking about privatization of ESCOM. I'm, I'm simply saying because of the tariff, because of the sales of ESCOM, ESCOM will just um, disappear. And all what will be left with is the independent power producers and the provision of electricity would have been privatized through the independent power producers. So we need to change tech and accept that we need renewable energy technologies, but we must do it at the cost and the pace that we can afford. ESCOM is too big to fail. And we must save it, but as it is, it's failed. Let us not push it over the edge and do so be mindful that engineer Machela Koko has no intention of going back to ESCOM. I've done my country duty. I've done it for, 24, for 25 years. It's time for other people to do, to take over from where we left. We have a duty to do in the region to end energy poverty. Comrades and friends, I thank you.